is going on YouTube? Well, this is a very special occasion because I have an amazing guest with me. This is my wife. Uh, I guess we could call her Mrs. Buff. Is that what we figured out? Sure. The dog is like history rough. We started this whole thing. I don't know. But uh, it, it is what it is. So she is going to join me for her first ever YouTube video. So I didn't think this day would ever happen. She's very supportive on my channel. Um, she's she's She watches my videos and things. I've been on here with my son, but here is my wife. So the biggest reason I have the wife on today is because I've checked out Oversimplified. And today we're going to look at the American Revolution, which she is... An expert. I'm gonna throw her right under the bus. I'm not an expert. <laughs> and say she's an expert. <laughs> um, where I tend to focus more on medieval Europe and things like that. She studied uh, American history very heavily. She has two master's degrees in history. Um, one in archival studies. She can re uh, what re fix. I couldn't think of the right word. Fix old books. What do you call it? Restore. Restore. Restore old books. Yeah, and um, archival studies and uh, genealogy and rare documents and super fun stuff that history geeks really like to freak out about. But speaking of uh, historical documents, I do want to give a quick shout out to History by Mail, who is being awesome enough to partner with me on my channel. Um, you can use the code HISTORYBUFF, two words, I'm going to put a disc uh, link right here in the video. Um, visit them and put my code in, and that will be the special, uh, I don't think you get a discount yet, but at least um, it'll, it'll let them know that, that I referred you. Uh, so you can also you can actually from that website get different uh, primary historical documents. Um, of course, they're reproduced, but they're reproduced very well. Here's a check for Alaska. We purchased for Alaska and a few other really cool things and stuff like that too. So please check out History by Mail. But without any further ado, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get cruising and check out Oversimplified: The American Revolution. All right. So it's been a while since we've done these dual. These are tough. Because I could edit out all of my, like, you know. But when there's two of us, it's a little more difficult. And real quick, we're drinking. I've got some burb cherry-infused bourbon. Cherry-infused bourbon. And I only had two drinks, and I'm already. And then you've got, what is this? I have just a caps off. Caps off. Traditional. Yeah, nice. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and check this out. I know the other videos are awesome. This is going to be about a half hour long just to watch it, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. But of course, really quick, only disclaimer you get, I like to talk a whole bunch. My wife, believe it or not, likes to talk almost even more. So we'll see what happens. But it's the first video, so <laughs> that's your only warning you get. So here we go. Holy smokes. Christopher Columbus, that is no way to address the king and queen of Spain. What is wrong with you? Okay, okay, so you know how we're looking for a new trade route to India, right? Right. And the earth is round, right? Right. So I'm thinking we can just sail the other way around the planet, right? Yeah. So I set sail, right? Mm hmm And I reach India, right? Right. Wrong. Wrong. I did not reach <laughs> India. I did not. All right. No. All right. Get to the point. Did you know? There's a whole nother freaking continent out there. Okay, and you think I should care about this? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget to mention there's gold everywhere? Gold? Ah! <laughs> Columbus landed in Central America in October 1492, and he had the time of his life. And by that I mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree. He stole gold, jewelry, people, and a hammock. And then he returned to show off all of his riches, yeah. including a few previously undiscovered items, such as tobacco, the pineapple, turkeys, and a hammock. Now I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified, Columbus didn't discover America, the Vikings did. And you'd be partially right. In the 11th century, Leif Erikson was the first European to land in America. But hey, if you love Vikings so much, then why don't you check out today's sponsor? Vikings War of Clans is a mobile game that was oh, inspired by the okay. theme. So actually, I was I was watching this uh, this anime called Vinland, which is kind of about Leif Erikson, and I guess they, you know, so that's kind of cool if you're into that kind of thing. Any comments so far? I'm okay. You're okay. Okay. Columbus, time of his life, hammock. And suddenly the race was on to explore and conquer the new world. After a couple centuries of warring with the natives and each other, the European powers had claimed quite a lot of land, including this area, which France, both right? the English and the French claimed as theirs. One day the French said, I'm going to build some forts along here. And the English were like, could you not? And the French said, sorry, but no, I could not not. And they went ahead and built their forts, which pissed off the English. So they sent an up and coming British lieutenant colonel by the name of George Washington with a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. After a short battle, the French commander said, all right, all right, we surrender. OK, boys, pack it up. They're surrendering. Oh, sorry, was I not meant to split his head open with a tomahawk? Ah, 
Don't worry. It's not like this will start a seven-year-long major global conflict. And what happened French next was a seven-year-long major Damn. global conflict, which Great Britain won. At the peace negotiations, Spain gave up Florida, while France gave up all of its territories in North America. But Britain's victory came at a cost, a 60 million pound cost. They were now broke, in a lot of debt, and had to come up with some way to repay it. So they went to the colonies and said, okay, listen up. So a huge part of the war was spent protecting you from the French, and now we have no money because of it. So... I'm not sure what you're saying here. Okay, so we spent a lot of money protecting you from the French, right? Right. And now we're broke. That certainly is a pickle. Listen to me. We spent all of our money protecting you, and now we need money. Can you please pay us back some money? Is this how it went? No. <laughs> okay, we're just going to go ahead and tax you. In 1764, Britain introduced the Sugar Act, forcing the colonists to import sugar and molasses exclusively from the British and to pay duties on them. Then a year later, they introduced the extremely controversial Stamp Act, and it worked a little something like this. Hello, shopkeep. Hello, Mr. Bungleberry. Well, they were getting their sugar from the Caribbean. So in essence, they're getting their sugar from the Caribbean. They're transporting it back to England. They are then using you know, the Industrial Revolution at that point in time to make sugar, and then they're selling it to the colonists at an inflated rate. So, yeah, of course, that's going to piss anybody off. Mm. Okay. You put a few middlemen in there, huh? All right. controversial Stamp Act, and it worked and a little something is. like this. Hello, shopkeep. Hello, Mr. Bungleberry. Here's the deed for your new shack. Stamp. That'll be three pence, please. Wait, what was that? It's the new tax. I get a stamp on any paper or documentation I make, and you have to pay for it. Would you like to see this pamphlet that explains everything? Yes, please. Okay. Stamp. Two pence, please. This is awful. You know what? Just give me a deck of cards so I can go gamble my pain away. Okay. No. Stamp. <laughs> Don't do it. Stamp. Obviously, the colonists were like, hey, my dudes, this new tax legislation right here, this is BS. Until now, they had enjoyed relative freedom to rule themselves, and now suddenly Britain was asserting its control. They were especially unhappy because they didn't have any representatives in the parliament that was levying taxes on them. So they protested. Orators gave fiery speeches. British goods were boycotted, and anyone loyal to the British found themselves increasingly harassed. The whole thing actually began to take quite a toll on British business, and after just a couple years, the British were forced to repeal the Stamp Act. But we still desperately need money. What should we do? We could try taxing the colonies. Great idea. Wait, didn't we literally just try that and it failed miserably? Man, look at me. I look fabulous. Have you ever seen such a handsome boy? No sorry, <laughs> Georgian. No way. You're the handsomest, smartest, most popular king that ever lived, and everybody likes you. You're doing such a good job. But your majesty? Oh, you're still here. <laughs> Get the hell out. So in 1766, the British made a declaration saying, we can do what we want because we're in charge and you can all go suck it. Then they levied a whole bunch of new taxes on the Americans via import duties. Glass? There's a tax for that. Lead? There's a tax for that. Paper? Tea? Oil? There's a tax for that. And once again, the Americans boycotted British goods, British business felt the pinch, and the British had to back down. All right, this is ridiculous. They're my colonies and I have to be able to assert my control. Repeal all the new taxes except for the one on tea. Also send 1,000 troops to Boston to take control. Oh, and make the colonists pay for them. And as British troops arrived, the tension in Boston was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, and it was all about to come to a head. On March 5th... So wait, the colonists, the colonies had to pay for the troops? Yes. Oh. So not only did they have to pay for the troops, they also had to house the troops in their own homes and in public places where they normally would visit. And the British could in essence, especially if it was your uh, high-ranking military officers, they could kick you out of your home and be like, well, I live here now, so you just have to suck it up, buttercup. And the reason why they were so upset about the tea is because they were getting garbage tea from India and they were trying to sell it to the colonists at an inflated rate. And of course, they're like, I don't want to pay for this garbage tea. I'd rather have something that's much better. And they're like, well, this is all you're going to get because you're just colonists. Ah. Okay. I thought there was a term for that. No no housing, no quarter. There was some kind of a phrase or something that came from housing troops or something. I don't know. It's okay. I took a little class about this. Thing. The tension in Boston was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, and it was all about to come to a head. On March 5th, a band of local patriots began heckling a British guard at the customs house. Wait a minute. More we're trying to we're trying to figure out sharing Bluetooth so 
Okay, we're good. And as now. British troops arrived, the tension in Boston was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, good. and it was all about to come to a head. On March 5th, a band of local patriots began heckling a British guard at the, the Customs House. house. Oh. More and more Americans joined in the heckling, while more British troops turned up in support of their comrade. Snowballs were thrown at the British. The snowballs turned to rocks, the rocks to oyster shells. The soldiers, outnumbered, panicked. One thing leads to another, and you can see where this is going. Five civilians were killed. The Patriot press throughout the colonies declared the Boston Massacre an unwarranted crime committed against the people of Boston by the cruel British, and the anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran aground in Rhode Island was burned by the locals. When it came to light that the governor of Massachusetts supported the suppression of the colonists, his house was burned by the locals. And next, the colonists would set their sights on the remaining tax on tea. On December 16th, 1773, a band of patriots known as the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Native Americans, marched down to Boston Harbor, boarded a British merchant ship loaded with tea, and in front of thousands of spectators, threw nearly 10,000 pounds worth of tea overboard. The British were disgusted, the and they punished Massachusetts with a vengeance. They dissolved its General Assembly, revoked their charter, and sent 3,000 more troops to occupy the city, meaning Boston and Massachusetts were now essentially under the direct rule of Great Britain. And oh boy, were the people pissed. The other colonies saw what was happening and worried they might be next. So they called a brain trust to decide what to do. 56 delegates from 12 colonies gathered and met in Philadelphia at the First Continental Congress. And the roll call read like a who's who of America's finest thinkers. I'm talking lawyers extraordinaire Johnny A and Johnny J, experienced military commander George Washington, businessman and future alcoholic beverage Samuel Adams, fiery orator Patty H. Guy who married a rich lady, Big J Dickinson. And while they weren't present at the first Congress, soon names like James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and much later Alexander Hamilton would all serve time in the Continental Congress. The question now, though, was what to do about the British. After much bitter debate and disagreement, they eventually agreed on an amazing solution. They would simply ask the British to stop. Can you stop? No. It didn't work. Okay, then tell the local <laughs> militias to start arming and be ready at a minute's notice. And across the colonies, these Minutemen stood ready for the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. Now having your colonies in open rebellion is one thing. Once they start arming themselves, that's when it really hits the fan. So British General <laughs> Thomas Gage ordered 700 troops from Boston out into the rebel-controlled Massachusetts countryside to destroy stores of arms and ammunition held by the rebels in Concord. The British set out in the middle of the night. Patriots, including Paul Revere, rode ahead to warn that the British were coming, giving the rebels time to prepare. The two sides met in Lexington as the sun began to rise. They faced off against each other, and in the confusion, somebody shot first. The shot heard around the world marked the beginning of the American War of Independence. The rebels were outnumbered and had to fall back to Concord as the British split up to search for rebel supplies. However, more and more patriot rebels... Hey, real quick. Wasn't there some kind of Mandela thing with... Yes. Okay, so the Mandela effect that people get very confused with the Paul Revere's ride to Lexington is that he yelled, the British are coming, the British are coming. But they're all British. They are all British. And right. they saw themselves as British. They didn't see themselves as what we now know ourselves to be Americans. They thought, well, we're British. And so therefore, what Paul Revere shouted was, the Redcoats are coming. The Redcoats are coming. Mm. And then another interesting fact, Paul Revere did not make the entire journey. He had to stop uh, and switch horses and riders. And at different checkpoints, different riders would take place. And there were actually several females that took over the job of riding. Oh, cool. He looks a lot like Jack Black, too. I like, love how they cross it crazy out. Crazy style. Heard around the world marked the beginning of the American War of Independence. The rebels were outnumbered and had to fall back to Concord as the British split up to search for rebel supplies. However, more and more patriot rebels kept showing up. And this time, it was the British who were outnumbered as more fighting kicked off in Concord. The most professional army in the world was forced to flee back to Boston at the hands Boy, of local... what's that flag? Is that an initial flag they had? The rebels? Okay. Concord, the most professional army in the world, was forced to flee back to Boston at the hands of local, poorly trained militiamen. And all along the British route back to Boston, Patriot rebels continued to gather and open Smack fire on the retreating back. British. When the British reached Boston, the rebel militias surrounded them. Boston and the British were now under siege as small land and naval skirmishes continued around the city. And the British would suffer another embarrassing blow. 
This time in upstate New York, Colonel Benedict Arnold concocted a plan to take the British stronghold Fort Ticonderoga, which held a large amount of guns and ammunition. He set off towards Holy the guns. fort alone, hoping to recruit men along the way when he came across the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen, who as it turned out, had the exact same plan he did. So they decided to work together, but I'm in charge. No, 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 I'm in charge. This went on for some time, until the Green Mountain Boys threatened to go home, and Arnold had to concede. The group raided the fort at night while the Redcoats were asleep, and they caught them completely by surprise, taking the fort and all of its munitions with almost no resistance. Wow, great job, Ethan. Very impressive. By the way, what happened to that other guy we sent to take the fort? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. What. The. F Nobody knew what was going on. The colonies were in open rebellion, and for now, they even seemed to be winning. So King George fired General Gage, replaced him with General William Howe, and ordered the rebellion to be put down immediately. Okay, the British are definitely going to retaliate for all of this, so we should probably put together a proper army. First, we need to pick a commander-in-chief, and I think we can all agree that that job should go to the man, the myth, the legend, George Washington. My friends, I am humbled and honored that you would consider me for such an important role. I did not expect for this All break. right, you've been showing up in a military uniform every day for the last 10 months. We all know you wanted this, so cut the crap, George. Dude. <laughs> Uncool. So Washington began his journey up to Boston to take command of the newly established Continental Army, just as the British made their first major attempt to break the siege. They made plans to take the high ground on Bunker Hill, but spies warned the Continentals of the stripes. British plans, so they fortified Bunker Hill and set up defensive positions on nearby Breed's Hill. The day of the battle came, and as the British advanced, a barrage of Continental gunfire was opened up on them. Twice they tried to climb the hill, twice they were pushed back. The battle lasted three hours until the Continentals finally ran out of ammunition and had to retreat, allowing the British to take the hill. While technically a British victory, they suffered nearly 1,000 casualties to the Continentals' 400. The colonists showed the British that this wasn't just a rebellion, it was war, and they were ready for it. But one thing they weren't sure about was why they were fighting. While some radicals were starting to throw around the I-word, most hoped to eventually repair their relationship with Great Britain. So they sent a letter to King George saying, Hey man, looks like things aren't going your way. Remove the taxes and let's be friends. I'm gonna kick your ass. Send that to the colonies. Your Majesty, your handwriting is terrible. Are you sure? Just do it. What does it say? He's gonna lick my... Gross. So for the remainder of the year, small engagements continued to occur around the colonies. The British burned down the towns of Falmouth, Massachusetts, and Norfolk, Virginia as revenge for earlier anti-British incidents. These actions played right into the hands of Patriot propaganda. Overseas, the British were seen as brutes, and the French and Spanish would soon begin sending supplies to the rebel cause. During this time, there was also minor fighting going on between Patriot and Loyalist militias in the southern colonies. Benedict Arnold was still on a mission to win some personal glory for himself, so he headed up an attempt to invade Canada in a two-pronged attack. The Continentals managed to capture some British forts and the the city of Montreal, but a harsh snowstorm with some smallpox on the side saw them defeated and pushed back at Quebec smallpox City, and they were the forced to retreat all the way to Fort Ticonderoga. Speaking of which, remember all those guns and ammunition? Well, this guy's got a plan for what to do with them. He uses oxen to drag 120,000 pounds of artillery for two months through the harsh winter, 300 miles all the way to Washington and his Continental Army surrounding Boston. Boom. Washington's got himself some big guns, which is fortunate because up until now his army had been suffering through the cold winter, not knowing when the siege would end. Now, they could make a move. Washington wanted to launch a full assault on the city, but his junior officers felt the British were too fortified, and to his credit, Washington was great at hearing and taking on board the ideas of others. Instead, the Continentals worked through the night setting the guns up on Dorchester Heights overlooking the city, and when dawn broke and the British saw the guns, they knew they were toast. Their positions were completely exposed. It was checkmate. They had no choice but to abandon the city. 120 ships carried 9,000 redcoats and 2,000 loyalists away to an unknown fate, and Washington had his first victory of the war. Washington then moved his army to New York, knowing that when the British returned, they would probably land there. In the meantime, a friendly-looking old man by the name of Thomas Paine had written and published a pamphlet called Common Sense, in which he advocated for total independence from Great Britain. It spread across the colonies like wildfire, and to this day remains the best-selling title in America. It was read aloud in taverns and meeting halls, and brought the idea of independence into the mainstream. Congress began to seriously consider the idea. Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official declaration of independence, and he went hard, writing that so, all you know, Let's take a moment real quick to talk about the fact, like, this is new stuff, right? Like, for us, it's, like, freedom, independence, it, it just kind of makes sense. It's kind of ground into our DNA, the way we think. But, like, back then, the, the monarchy and the idea of not having a monarchy and a democracy and all that, it's kind of, it's a newer concept, right? America kicked off independence, just being 
completely separate from a monarchy not being under their control anymore. You know, repercussions from the American Revolution actually end up, you know, starting the French Revolution. They sent aid to us, so, you know. And you had a bunch of other colonies, right? It just they kind of like, did. It just... Cool. Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official declaration of independence, and he went hard writing that all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, Jefferson had over 100 slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On the 2nd of July, Congress voted unanimous. No. Okay, one quick thing. Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence. However, John Adams and Ben Franklin had to proofread it because... He did go hard, and he went a little too overboard, and they had to make sure that it was worded eloquently to where people not from just Virginia and Massachusetts would get on board with, because it was an all or nothing. Everybody becomes united, or none of us do it. United or die, right? Well, and it, it, what didn't he want to say something about ending slavery? But they're like, that's not a battle for today. Or was that just in the show that we watched? No, no, they they thing? they really wanted to end slavery. They were not entirely keen on the fact that it was brought to America, and so you know that was one thing that Jefferson wanted to write in there. And they were like, listen, let's just get through us becoming independent. We'll table that, and we'll circle back later. Because certain colonies would not have jumped on board if they would have. Correct. Your southern states of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia would have been like, I'm out. Of course, Jefferson had over 100 slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On the 2nd of July, Congress voted unanimously in favor of independence, and John Adams declared that the 2nd of July would go down as the most remembered day in American history. Then a couple days later, independence actually came into effect. The United States of America was born. There was no turning back now. The Americans tore down a statue of King George in New York and melted him down into 42,000 musket bowls. To the British, it was treason. And if the king had his way, Washington and all of Congress would be hung. Speaking of the British, guess who's back? The king sent an intimidating force of 130 warships and 25,000 men to New York. Washington knew that taking on the most powerful military in the world wouldn't be easy. The British set up camp on Staten Island as the Americans dug into defensive positions around Brooklyn Heights, waiting for an attack to come. But the British just waited, wearing down their opponent's nerve while building their own strength. At one point, they launched a big scary artillery barrage and then said, you know, if I was you right now, I'd probably sue for peace. But Washington told them to shove it. The Americans kept holding out for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decal. I'd probably sue for peace. But Washington told them to shove it. The Americans kept holding out for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decoy. The main British force was going around to flank the Americans from behind, and when they arrived, they inflicted heavy casualties. The Americans panicked and retreated retreated back to Brooklyn Heights, where they then found themselves trapped between the British Army and the river. It looked as though the war was already lost, but luckily, instead of attacking, the British decided to dig in for a siege, and then a thick fog set in, allowing Washington's army to escape across the river unimpeded. The British continued to chase and engage the Americans off Manhattan, and the Americans suffered defeat after defeat after defeat. It was a disaster. Washington's leadership was called into question, as thousands of American POWs were left to rot as traitors. Washington's army fled through New Jersey all the way down to Pennsylvania. Rarely had an army been so badly beaten, yet survived to fight another day. Dang. All right, that's the end of part one. We'll just go right into part two. Washington's spot was sufficiently kicked. Winter was here. His troops' morale was low. Some just up and left. Washington needed to do something, anything to restore faith in the revolution. The British had spread throughout New Jersey and settled in for a winter of drinking cider and partying hard. Nobody expected an attack in the winter, so Washington started making plans for an attack in the winter. The British had hired a large force of Hessian mercenaries from the German states of Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau to fight the rebels. It was these mercenaries that were stationed across the Delaware River from Washington and his army. And there were more Hessian reinforcements incoming, but they made non-scheduled stop because their commander got thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty that kind of thirsty. It was Christmas Eve with a blizzard outside when Washington heard the Hessian defenses were down and he decided to attack. 
He made a perilous crossing of the icy Delaware River with 2,400 men and marched nine miles to Trenton where he caught the Hessian forces completely off guard. After a short but fierce battle, the Hessians surrendered in droves. It was a much needed victory that sent a clear message, not only to the British, but to Americans across the colonies. The war was far from lost. General Cornwallis wait, led the British forces. Show everybody your shirt real quick. Oh. We'll, what does it say? We'll cross a Americans frozen... Americans will cross a frozen river to kill you in your sleep on Christmas. Not kidding. We've done it before. <laughs> Perfect. Every historian, American historian's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> to Americans across the colonies. The war was far from lost. General Cornwallis led you. the British forces south to counterattack the Americans, but in a series of battles, Washington's defensive positioning and flanking Ass maneuvers and defeated wait, the British wait. three yes. times in oh. 10 days. And the British decided to abandon <laughs> Southern New Jersey for the rest of the winter. Washington finally set up a winter camp in Morristown, but for the Americans, there was much less partying than the British. Elsewhere, the British had taken Newport, Rhode Island, because it was a good naval base. In the south, they failed to take Charleston, South Carolina, which left British loyalists unsupported and vulnerable to more harassment and even mass expulsion. Barely Congress sent Benjamin Franklin to France on a mission to convince day. them to join the war. And while the French generally loved any opportunity to hoodwink the Brits, they didn't want to join unless it was a sure win. So for now, Franklin spent his days chilling out and chasing tail. The British oh, Parliament yeah. couldn't believe the war was, was famous over in France, and the right? pressure was I on to end it. So the British came up with a plan. General Burgoyne in Montreal right. and General well, William... Wait, wait, let's talk about it real quick. So explain uh, Ben Franklin in France. So... Our founding father, Ben Franklin, wasn't as pure as everybody likes to think he is. Not only did he have a family in Philadelphia, but he also created a second one in France because he was very promiscuous. Women would be found in his quarters daily, so much so that when John Adams was with him, he was very upset by how Franklin was behaving. And so Franklin was like, listen, if you want us to get the help we need, you have to adapt to their culture. And it was very, very difficult for my beloved John Adams, the curmudgeon that he was, to to understand. And it was even so much so that, that later Thomas Jefferson would say that nobody under the age of 25 should go to France because of how... <laughs> different it was from the rest of the world it was it was not conservative at all <laughs> yeah you had an interesting group so you had ben franklin who was just very right like and, and you had thomas jefferson very free spirit right, right? And, and then his, you had adams who was just pure in like yes he was hardcore his dad was a minister and so he was he was very this is how it should be don't do this don't do that don't cheat on your wife <laughs> and franklin was like meh it happens <laughs> And, and our daughter is actually named after. Yes. Abigail, our daughter, is actually named after Abigail Adams, as mm -hmm. she is my favorite female historical character, particularly from the time of America. See, I told you it happens. 30 minutes. That's okay. There we go. So, oh, and one other thing. The coonskin cap that Franklin wore, the French thought it was the greatest thing ever, and people were making them left and right because they thought that it was just... That's an American. He wears a coonskin hat. Look at him. But was it and the concept of like liberty that they were latching onto? Like it was just this like pipe dream, and then he was like the figurehead for them, or was it just other? I think they were just enamored that somebody could actually do this to their great rival, England, because the French hated the British and vice versa. Oh. Makes sense. The pressure was on to end it, so the British came up with a plan. General Burgoyne in Montreal and General William Howe in New York would advance through the Hudson Valley and meet in the middle, splitting the colonies in two and thus screwing over the American communication lines. Burgoyne began his movement south, and after taking Fort Ticonderoga quite easily, he then came across heavy American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle-dongle, asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Howe had completely abandoned the plan and gone for all our personal glory by capturing the American capital, Philadelphia. He defeated Washington and his army at Brandywine Creek by using the old hit-him-with-a-decoy and flank him from behind tactic, and Philadelphia was yeah, now in British hands. Like forcing changing. Congress to escape mm -hmm. to Europe, so that's but Burgoyne was left right. on his own to face the ever-increasing American force in Saratoga. American General Horatio Gates teamed up with our old friend Benedict Arnold to deal one final blow to Burgoyne's army. Arnold wanted to take the fight to the British, but Gates wanted to wait for the British to come to them. After a heated debate, Gates, the senior officer, told Arnold to go to his room. But Arnold defied his orders, and at the Battle of Bemis Heights, he charged at the British and obliterated them. Great job, Horatio. By the way, what happened to that other guy who was in Saratoga? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. <laughs> hey, George. Didn't I, I do a great like job? Foreshadowing. Taking Philadelphia and all? Hmm? 
didn't I? You're fired. Both Burgoyne and Howe returned to Great Britain, <laughs> leaving British General Henry Clinton to take charge of the war. And the war was about to take a nasty turn, because with the victory at Saratoga, the French were finally ready to join the Americans. All right, Benny, we're in. Hey, isn't this kind of funny, you know, because you're a republic trying to overthrow an absolute monarchy, and I'm an absolute monarchy helping you? Like, like, could you imagine if your revolution inspired my people to revolt against me, and then they imprisoned me and all my family, or and they chopped all of our heads off? Could you imagine? That's cold. <laughs> Foreshadowing. For now in America, That's winter was here once yeah. again, which meant yet more disease, more starvation, and even a little mutiny. After losing Philadelphia, Washington's job was again on the line. But suddenly, a Prussian guy with a very fancy name, hired by Benjamin Franklin, showed up out of nowhere and said, Hey, I'm here to give your man a European military training. And this. train them he did. They learned how to shoot accurately, how to march in formation, where to poop and where not to, and strict punishments were handed out to any who didn't comply. Washington's army came out of the winter in 1778, a new and improved force, ready to take Philadelphia back from the British. In the end, though, they didn't have to. With the French entry into the war, the British ordered General Clinton to evacuate Philadelphia and consolidate all of the British forces in New York. So Washington sent Benedict Arnold to reoccupy and secure the city as he pursued the British through New Jersey on land, eventually finding a good opportunity to attack at Monmouth Courthouse. The battle took place on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died from heat stroke as they did from battle. In the end, after some incompetence slash borderline treason from Washington's second in command, it was a draw. And in this war, a draw is kind of a victory for the Americans. Next up, let's talk about this guy. This is John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones is handsome, Scottish, and absolutely insane. When the war first broke out, everyone was like, how did the colonies expect to stand up to the might of the British Navy with their meager fleet of converted merchantmen? Yep, try telling that to John Paul Jones. This guy sailed to the British Isles, somehow <laughs> captured a British ship off the coast of Ireland, and brought it back to France. Then he returned, attacking more ships, raiding towns, and evading capture the entire time. These are basically pirate tactics. But hey, if it works, it works. Forget In one Scott, incident, Scott's he captured man. a British ship and returned to a Dutch port without an official ensign because his was lost during the battle. That's a big no-no and can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like, and they entered it into their records as an official U.S. That's flag. Cool. What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole campaign probably played heavily on British morale and brought into question their Tattoo. ability to win the war. And fun fact, he was so cool that one of the towns he raided in 1778 gave him an official honorary pardon in 1999. Keep ripping in heaven, John Paul Jones, you're an angel now. What the Continental Navy was lacking in resources, though, the French entry into the war made up for. The French began with naval skirmishes in the English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The Americans were hoping for a bigger commitment from the French, so John Adams went to France to help Benjamin Franklin continue negotiations. Oh good, you're finally here. Check this out. Hey ladies, I'd like to fly you like a kite, because you're electrifying. <laughs> Isn't this great? Is this is this what you've been doing? This yeah. is exactly what? what you're talking about. We were sent here on a diplomatic mission to secure military support from France, not to philander with the locals. Wait, no, ladies, come back. <sighs> Worst wingman ever. <laughs> but the Americans would get some more help. The Dutch provided aid, although they never formed an official alliance. More significantly, though, the Spanish, who had already been providing aid, officially joined the war in June 1779. They would provide support in the Midwest and the Gulf Coast, campaigns that heavily impacted the Native American tribes That's in those Spain. areas. Both sides actually enlisted the help of Native Spanish. American tribes throughout the war, sometimes even pitting those tribes against each other. In the summer of 1779, after a series of raids against the Americans by the Iroquois, Washington organized an expedition that burned down more than 40 villages, forcing the tribes to relocate to Canada for British protection. And another group that shouldn't go unmentioned were African Americans, both free and enslaved. They joined both sides of the war, hoping to gain their freedom. But afterwards, many were simply returned to slavery, particularly those who had fought for the Americans. Despite owning slaves himself, Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but out of fear of offending the southern colonies, this was removed from the final draft. For the same we reason, the American army stopped enlisting African-American men in 1775, a policy that Washington, a slave owner himself, supported. But they were forced to reverse the policy after the British promised freedom to any slaves who joined them. In general, you stood a better chance of gaining freedom if you fought for the British. However, even those that left with the British after the war suffered mistreatment and discrimination in their new lives outside of America. Our good friend Benedict Ar Interesting. Okay, and, and another quick note that the the first person to die in the Boston Massacre was African American. Mm. What was his name? He was pretty famously talked about. Crispus? Um, Atticus Christmas. Atticus. Christmas Atticus. That's it. Yep. Atticus. Christmas Atticus. Yeah. Yes. Great job. I'm hey. so proud of you. See, look at I know some shit. 
I get, and we'll get this too. Like after this video, there'll be people like, well, you know, you, you, you blah, 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 blah. Remember, but like, this is just an overview. Yeah. And not only that, we, she even asked me, she's like, we don't get to watch this first. I'm like, nope, nope. We got to watch it fresh. And you just literally, and we're drinking. So you literally spout the first thing that comes to your brain. And we apologize if we get something wrong. But it's so far. a lot far, of foreshadowing. But so far, I think we're doing it. pretty good. The we're killing and it. Discrimination in the I don't new foresee any mass our good friend Benedict Arnold is now in charge of Philadelphia, having a good time, partying down with, and even marrying a member this of the guy. Philadelphia elite. The same elite that had partied down with the British when they controlled the city. And suddenly, the people of Philadelphia, including the state governor, started accusing Arnold of having pro-British sentiments. To keep the people happy, Washington wrote a letter rebuking Arnold, calling his conduct imprudent and improper, and that was too many ouchies for Benedict Arnold to handle. Yeah, he asked Washington snap. to put him in charge Dead. of the fort at West Point. Then he contacted the British, offering to hand the plans of the fort over to them and join the their side. <laughs> yes, our good friend Benedict no. Arnold is our good friend no more. Luckily, the treasonous plans were discovered on a captured British officer, but Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British brigadier general, he would go into hey, leave. Can we talk time. super quick? Yes. And, you know, I, I, here we go. But, like, the whole spy ring that was happening through all of this, right? Right. It was intense. Oh, fabulous. The Culpepper spy ring. It was Washington's baby. And so espionage during this time period was considered very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ungentlemanlike. The worst of the worst were the spies. You didn't have gentry or anybody that had prestige because it was ugh, espionage. However, the spy ring that Washington created served very valuable in undertaking missions such as uh, getting information in New York by uh, pretending to be a school teacher Ooh. or ha or drafting females into the into the ring to pass messages through their garments since the British forces were staying with colonials so yeah and Benedict Arnold yeah that guy what was that cool show we were watching about the spy ring do you remember it was on the history channel um I have. Maybe we'll put it up. I'll, I'll we'll put, put it, it right in here. the link. Yeah. But, and I can put some good books down there if you really want to read some amazing books on yeah, the American Revolution. There was some really neat stuff happening. British officer, but Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British brigadier general, he would go on to lead raids against American cities, most notably his raid of Richmond, Virginia in 1781. His betrayal shook George Washington, who had once again set up camp at Morristown. His leadership somehow held the Continental Army together through the harshest winter <laughs> of the war. <laughs> We're entering 1780, and Parliament was hopping mad that the war still wasn't over. The British debt was soaring, and despite taking parts of Massachusetts in late 1779, the North was in a stalemate, so the British decided to make a major shift in strategy to the South, an economically rich area with a higher level of support for the British, or so the British thought. A year earlier, they had captured the underdefended city of Savannah, Georgia, easily, and a joint American-French counter siege failed. Now, they laid siege what to Charleston, South okay, Carolina, wait, wait. What was that flag? and a joint American-French... What is that? That's the French flag, the fleur de -lis. It's not like their That's actual flag, like? oh, but it's okay. just a bunch of Florida de Lee. Oh, okay. siege failed. These now, they really laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. It fell within months, with thousands of American troops surrendering to the British, a costly defeat. The British quickly moved to take control, and they sent stereotypical Hollywood villain with a British accent, Bannister the Butcher Tarleton, <laughs> into the back <laughs> the country, and yes. rebels he and was, them with he ruthless was brutal. brutality. The British presence also inspired local loyalist militias in the backcountry to rise up against their persecutors. The British really seemed to be onto something with their new strategy, and the ball was very much in Washington's court. I'm gonna send my most loyal general, Nathaniel Green, to the south to stop the British. Gonna have to overrule you there, George. We're sending Hero of Saratoga and your biggest rival, Horatio Gates. Watch this, George. I'm gonna save the day again. Everybody will love me, and I'm gonna get your job. Here I go. And he got into one battle with Cornwallis, got annihilated, and ran away. Alrighty, let's go with your guy. Nathaniel Green knew the British outnumbered his own forces and wouldn't be defeated with conventional tactics, so he had to think outside the box. He split his army into two, said, Hey, big boy, look at me, and then they went running in two different directions. Cornwallis sent Tarleton after Morgan, and he caught up with him at Cowpens, where Morgan proceeded to kick Tarleton's butt. Then the two led Cornwallis on a wild chase through North Carolina, his bigger and better equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's <laughs> quick and mobile troops. Green led Cornwallis further and further from his supply line, then crossed the Dan River into Virginia, picked up some reinforcements, and turned back to face the now exhausted British. At the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, the two sides engaged in vicious close combat. Cornwallis, fearing loss, fired his big guns into the chaotic fighting, cutting down many of his own men. Green retreated, giving Cornwallis the victory, but Cornwallis lost a quarter of his men in the fighting, so it felt much more like a British defeat. 
At this point, both sides desperately needed something to happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running out of money, while the Americans were again facing mutinies as the men went without pay or even basic living needs. Fortunately, the French were now showing up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South was to first prevent the Southern Continental Army from using Virginia. What? 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 Yes. That, that's fine, Abby. Just keep it down, okay? <laughs> okay. Virginia as a supply base. So he abandoned the Carolinas, moving to Wilmington and onto Yorktown, a position the British believed would be easy to supply and support. On his march to Yorktown, he raided many farms, stealing horses and supplies from the locals, <laughs> but also freeing thousands of slaves, many of whom joined him. The French saw Cornwallis' new position as an opportunity to land a decisive blow on the British. Washington wanted to attack Clinton in New York, but the French said it was a really dumb idea. <coughs> and to be fair, it was. Instead, Washington sent out fake dispatches to make it look like they would attack Clinton, but secretly their combined force marched all the way down to Virginia. A large French fleet under the command of Comte de Grasse arrived and successfully cleared the British Navy out of the Chesapeake Bay. The combined land and naval forces then laid siege to Cornwallis' army in Yorktown. Yorktown. The American like French forces there. tightened in around the city, raining artillery down on Cornwallis. Wallace, who desperately appealed to Clinton for aid, but Clinton was unusually chilled out about the whole thing. Cornwallis held out for nearly a month before he had no choice but to surrender. Over 7,000 British troops were captured, a crushing defeat, and with that, Parliament had reached the end of its rope. The war just wasn't worth it, and it needed to end now. The British still held New York, Charleston, and Savannah, but fighting between the two sides mostly ceased as peace negotiations opened up in Paris. The resulting treaty in 1783 saw Great Britain remove its troops from American soil, recognize U.S. independence, and cede territory up to the Mississippi River. In return, the Americans yeah. agreed to pay any debt still owed to Britain and gave fair treatment to any colonists who had remained loyal to the crown. The Spanish got Florida, while the French got an economic crisis that led to its own revolution a decade later. Washington retired to his home in Mount Vernon, wishing his men farewell by saying, I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. He hoped to live out the rest of his days in peace, but unfortunately for him, a number of people wanted him to be the first leader of the new country. And by a number of people, mm -hmm. I mean literally everyone. The first election campaign <laughs> in American history was basically a grassroots effort to convince Washington to accept the office. He was sworn in on April 30th, 1789, and he himself established many of the standards and limitations of what the American leader should be. First of all, there was debate on what he should be called. Is he a king? Is he our glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President. Like the president... Can I, Hey, real quick. So I do know that John Adams tend to be more on the... Almost the monarchy level of this right like he he expected the king the or i'm sorry the president to almost be like you know when you greeted him your highness and right like very he believed that you should bow when you see him that you should treat him as if he were a king and he even wanted regal titles for him but but washington was like no i'm not doing that like we just got away from a monarchy why would you want me to do it yeah like that doesn't make any sense and washington absolutely hated it like, he hated every every bit of it. He had no desire to be president at all. Not only once, but twice. And he begged them to just let him go home. He I'm just tired. wanted to go home. He was tired. My wooden teeth hurt. I I gotta... <laughs> whalebone. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> whalebone. My whalebone teeth hurt. My whalebone teeth hurt. Yeah. My chomps hurt. Yeah, if only... And isn't that crazy how, like, when it first established, you have somebody like that, so humble, but then now... You know, it, it, of course, evolved into what it is where it's like, you know, you, you don't see that grab. anymore. It's, it's a power, power grab. grab now. Yeah. All right. Glorious leader. In the end, they went for a word that at the time <laughs> what was, that? was pretty modest. Was that North Korea? Hang on. Yes. Yes. Is your glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President, like the president of your local bowling club or office bake sale committee. He set up a cabinet of expert advisors knowing that no president could know everything, no matter how much of a stable genius they claimed to be. He proposed major legislation to Congress and gave an annual State of the Union address to keep his own power in check. He stated that the U.S. should remain neutral in foreign conflicts, and in the end, he voluntarily gave up his power after just two terms. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted, but his careful and cautious actions helped set the precedent of an office that is powerful in its limitations, decisive through its diplomacy, and respected in its humility. And so the United States was born, and everything was perfect. It had no problems, not a single one. Certainly nothing that would, I don't know, cause such an extreme divide that it would lead to a civil war. <laughs> anyway, moving on. 
Quick quiz. <laughs> Name the most American thing you can think of. Baseball? Bold Eagles? Calling the winner of an America-only sports tournament world champion? This has got to be or a, maybe uh, math and an science. ad. Wait, math and science? That's that right. Like if you didn't know, science is as American as combining chicken with waffles. And don't just take my word for it. Ask Thomas Jefferson. Of course, to do that, you would need a time machine. And that would take some math and a lot of science. If you want to deeply understand math and science, yeah, say you want to thing. calculate the age of the universe. All right. So let's uh, we'll wrap that up real quick. we got a few things to talk about. So it was a crossroads, right? Like you had George Washington, the first, and he was very old and tired. And he's like, leave me the hell alone. Um, like you said, you know, like he was very humble about it. Um, he set up the terms like, listen, this is how much. But it could have been anything that it that it could have ended up being, right? You could have become president and then you got that for life and all that. So what were you about to say? So Washington was very adamant about making sure that there was a checks and balances system in place so that the president did not end up like a monarchist or an emperor, as you'll see with Napoleon or a dictator. Like we see later on in the 20th century with, you know, Stalin and Hitler and things like that. So, so Washington, when his cabinet came about, one of the things like like the the video said, you know, oh, like there's never going to be another civil war. There were two groups of people in Washington's cabinet. You had the Federalists, which thought that there should be a strong federal government, and your people like uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, and then you had your Republicans, which were Thomas Jefferson and his cohorts, because they believed that the powers should rely in the state and that each state should be able to make their own laws. He also believed in them making their own currency and, you know, but Alexander Hamilton, who is amazing, you should totally do a video on like the Founding Fathers. Yeah, you should do a video, that's your wheelhouse. <laughs> he was we a can young do guy it though, together. Wasn't he? He was young. Alexander Hamilton died when he was like in his late twenties, early thirties. That's crazy. And he like created the entire banking system. The didn't entire he? banking system. And he was poor. He lived in the Caribbean. He was so broke. Broke as a joke, but he was wicked smart. Wait a minute. Mommy, Daddy. What? What's up? There's an ice cream truck. I don't care. <gasps> well, do you guys have money? No. Probably not. I don't have cash either. Shut the door. Kids asking for goddamn ice cream truck. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> shut the door to my office, please. Thanks. Making a video in here. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, and then the way that the cabinet was established, you had Washington as president, and you had John Adams as vice president, and Thomas Jefferson was secretary of state. And that was your first cabinet for America. Yeah. And they set up all the checks and balances. Banking and system. That people talk a lot of shit about today. Mm -hmm. but. And the smallpox vaccine came out during this time. That was the one that was plaguing, like it said in the video. Yeah, I actually did a whole, oh man, I should cover that. Because I did the uh, Cotton Mather and yeah. all that in Boston and everything. Yeah. That was oh, huge. Oh, one cool thing. Okay, so check this out. The way you okay. got inoculated with smallpox back in the day is they would have dead people on a cart that would come by your house. They would cut open their sores, scoop out the nastiness, cut your arm, Slap that goop in there, mm -hmm. rub it in real good, and then hope that you survive getting the smallpox. And they learned that people were surviving. People were. And that they were better equipped to handle Correct. actual disease. Okay. So, inoculations, there you go, anti-vaxxers. It works. <laughs> cool. All right, so this was fun, man. Maybe we'll talk her into doing more of these in the future. I don't know. But... I'm not as animated as you. I don't oh, know. <laughs> no. I don't think that you're, no. So either way, we look forward to, uh, you know, checking you out in the comments. You know, if you guys have anything to say, any other videos to uh, recommend to us. But until we see you again, until that time, everybody be safe, healthy, and be nice to each other. Bye. <laughs> That's cool.